Hi, welcome back. I wanted to do a quick demo here to kind of introduce our next chapter, which is thermodynamics, the transfer of heat. So this is a product you may or may not be familiar with. Coaches or first aid people will carry it. It's an instant ice pack. So you don't need to put it in your refrigerator ahead of time. And when you first get the instant ice pack, it looks like this. Um, and here, let me show you all the directions. It says to um, locate the inner bag and you're gonna pop it and you're gonna shake it. Well, you might have wondered, or maybe now you're wondering, well, what is inside of there? So let's cut this open and investigate. Let me pour it out. I have a little bowl right here. Alrighty, so it kind of looks like like a gerbil food or something. Um, not much to look at. And then there's this pack here. I should stop moving it. This just has water in it. And this is the Walmart brand of the instant ice pack. The exact compound and, and what it's composed of, that's proprietary. Um, but a lot of these ice packs are composed of ammonium nitrate. And um, what happens is when ammonium nitrate dissolves in water, it gets really cold. It's what's known as an endothermic reaction. So the actual process of the ammonium nitrate breaking into ammonium and nitrate um, uh, takes in heat. So then when you put it on your, your injury or whatnot, you feel it getting colder because it's going to pull in the heat from your body or your skin. So this is what you're basically doing. You're opening up this when you pop this inner bag and then you're mixing it with the water and then the directions tell you to shake. So as you're shaking, this stuff starts dissolving. This is so much cooler in person. Um, because then, you know, you all can feel how cold this gets. It gets instantaneously cold. So again, the ammonium and the nitrate are connected, ammonium and nitrate. Um, in their solid form, they're connected. And then as they pull in heat, they're able to disconnect. And then that makes everything around it cold. Um, all righty. All right, let's tackle problem number four on page four. So this problem is a little bit different in that we have two things going on. And I want to be very deliberate and keep the information about those two things really organized. So I'm going to use a t-chart. On one side of my t-chart, I'm going to organize all the information for copper. And on the other side, I'll organize all the information for water. So let's look at it. Um, a block of copper has an unknown, of unknown mass, ooh, unknown mass, has an initial temperature of 65.4 degrees Celsius. The copper is immersed in a beaker containing 95.7 grams of water. So the mass of water is 95.7 at 22.7 degrees Celsius. So I'll put the initial temperature over here, and that's for the water. When the two substances reach thermal equilibrium. So at thermal equilibrium, all the heat transfer um, basically has occurred, and the temperature will be the same for both. So both of them at thermal equilibrium are going to be 24.2 degrees Celsius, and that'll be our final temperature. What is the mass of the copper block? So we're missing another piece of information, and that's the specific heat, but we can always grab that from a table of constants. So specific heat of copper, and this is from page two of your handout, is 0.385 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. 
And the water, you're going to have this memorized. You don't have to memorize it, but you're going to use it so much. It's uh, 4.184 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. All right, so earlier in the previous segment, I was talking about how um, when we have a reaction, we can say Q of the reaction is equal but opposite to Q of the solution. We can generalize this a little bit more and say Q of the system is equal but opposite to Q of the surroundings. When we're using the equation that I presented before, Q equals ms delta t, it has to be the same thing for each one of the numbers that you're plugging in. So for instance, if you're doing Q of copper, then you better be plugging in mass of copper and specific heat of copper and the delta t of copper. You can't mix the mass of the copper with the mass of the water, the specific heat of water. This is only good for one thing. So what we'll do then is we're going to use like a combination of the two. So we'll call our system the copper. And we'll say that in this particular problem, the water is the surrounding. So they took this hot piece of copper and they dropped it into a cup of water. Now, with this relationship, we can specifically say um, the mass of the copper times the specific heat of the copper times T final minus T initial of the copper equals... Don't forget that negative sign, I'll throw everything off. So negative mass of the water times the specific heat of the water, T final. I'm not putting a, like a subscript on T final because both systems have the same, the system and the surroundings have the same T final. And then uh, T initial of the water. So as you can see here, the left side of my equation is all about copper and the right side of my equation is all about the water. Alrighty, now at this point I can start plugging in all the values that I organized earlier. So mass of copper is unknown, so I'll just keep that like that. Specific heat of copper is 0 0.385 joules divided by grams times degrees Celsius. Uh, final temperature, 24.2 degrees Celsius minus the initial temperature, 65.4 degrees Celsius. We got the mass of our water, 95.7 grams. Um, specific heat of water. T final of the water. What is T initial of the water? You see me looking like on my T chart over and over again. Invaluable for me when I'm doing these kind of problems. Um, so this side isn't too bad. It's all numerical. So I'll tackle the parentheses first. So I'll do um, 24.2 minus 22.7 and that gives me 1.5. So we have negative 95.7 grams of water times 4.184 times 1.5. Then I'll just multiply those three values. And I get negative 600.6132. We always want to follow our units through these types of problems. Grams cancel grams, degrees Celsius, degrees Celsius, and I'm just left with joules. On the other side, I'm going to do the delta T part first. So 
So for delta T, I got negative 41.2 degrees Celsius. And I want to multiply that times the specific heat of copper. And this is still hanging out over here, the mass of copper. So degrees Celsius, I'm going to multiply specific heat times delta T, 0.385 times negative 41.2. Um, so mass of copper times negative 15.862. Joules over grams equals negative 600.6132. Trying to isolate the mass of the copper, so I'll divide each side by negative 15.862. Joules are canceled joules, and I'm just left with grams. So that's going to be the units, which is perfect, right? We're solving for mass. And then you'll notice we got two negative signs here. And that also works out to our favor because mass can't be negative. The two negatives will cancel, giving us a positive mass. So negative uh, 600.6132 divided by that negative 15.862. And I get... 37.9 um, grams of copper. All right, let's do another problem together. One of the main complaints I hear about this chapter and this material is that students um, don't know what to do. Every single problem is a little bit different from the previous problem, and I think that makes the material really challenging. Um, you really have to be creative in your problem solving approach. So I encourage you all to hang in there. Um, this isn't easy by any means. This is probably one of the hardest chapters in the course. So on this problem, there's some stainless steel ball bearings. And they put them in a constant pressure calorimeter. So they put them in a coffee cup. Um, and then they're talking about the water, and they want us to calculate the final temperature of the water. So once again, I'm going to start by organizing all my information. So I have, um, I'm going to just do SS for the stainless steel. And we have water. So 30.14 grams of stainless steel, that's my mass. At 117.82, sounds like an initial temperature, placed in a constant pressure calorimeter. The calorimeter has um, 120 mils of water. So I was about to write mass, but that's more like a volume, right? So the volume of water is 120.0 mils and they gave us an initial temperature. A little bit chilly, but slightly below room temperature. Um, they do provide the specific heat of the ball bearing, or the stainless steel, right? And we know the specific heat of water, or we can look it up. Assume that the calorimeter has negligible heat capacity, so we're not worried about um, potential heat transfer to the cup. We'll just pretend that all the heat from the stainless steel went directly into the water. And then they want us to calculate the final temperature of the water. Oh, I see a little mistake here. This was the initial temperature. And they want us to calculate the final temperature of the water. In addition, we're told to use one gram per mil as the density of the water. And so that's really handy. Um, so basically, if the density is one gram per mil, um, 
just multiply by that, and so then I do know that I have a mass of 120 grams of water. All right, so let's set this up. We have a system and a surroundings going on. So Q of the system is equal but opposite to Q of the surroundings. More specifically, I could say Q of the stainless steel ball bearings is equal but opposite to Q of the water. I'm going to use my Q equals MS delta T. So the mass of the stainless steel times the specific heat of the stainless steel times the final temperature of the stainless steel minus the initial temperature of the stainless steel equals, now we're on the water side. So mass of water specific heat of water, um, final temperature of the water, minus initial temperature of the water. They've asked us to solve for the final temperature of the water, but looking back on my T-chart, I realized, what's going on with the stainless steel? Um, and let's see if I can figure that out by going back and looking at my problem. And what I did in my head, you're like, well, well, how did you know what to do? I'm kind of doing like a mental check in my head. So, and you could physically do it as well. I'm like, I have this value. I have this value. I have this. I know this. I know this. I know this. But I don't know the temperature final of the stainless steel, and I don't know the temperature final of the water. We can only have one unknown because we only have one equation. And poorly written problem, it's not really telling us what's going on, but we can assume thermal equilibrium because we said that the heat of the stainless steel in the system is equal to the negative of the water. So when we write this, we'd have to be at thermal equilibrium. It would have been nice if they said that in a problem, but therefore the temperature final of the stainless steel has to equal the temperature final of the water. And I, I guess it's not at thermal equilibrium initially, it's just when we set up these problems. Um, the final temperatures are going to be at thermal equilibrium. All right, so let's plug and chug. And then because of that relationship, they're, they're one and the same, I can like get rid of the subscripts here. So I mean about every single problem being a little bit different. All right, let's plug everything in. So 30.14 grams times 0 0.474 joules divided by grams times degrees Celsius. T final, I don't know. But the initial temperature is 117.82 degrees Celsius. And then mass of the water, 120 grams, times 4.184, 60 feet of water. I don't know the final temperature, but according to the problem, it started out 18.44 degrees Celsius. Alrighty, so let's work to simplify, combine like terms as much as we can. Um, I'm going to multiply these two things. And when I multiply, I'll put it in a cloud so you know what I'm doing. When I multiply them, the grams will cancel with grams. And then I'm going to do that over here as well. I'm going to multiply both of these. There's so many different ways, algebraically or different 
um, pathways that you can take to solve this. Um, so if you're doing it a different way, you're working ahead and you're like, oh, um, I didn't do it that way, but you still got the same answer. It's great. Um, so multiply those two. I get 14.28636 joules divided by degrees Celsius. And then I still have this term. So negative 120 times 4.184. Negative 502.08. All right, from here you could distribute, um, but that's an awful lot of distribution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this over so I don't have to distribute on both sides. So I'm going to do four, divide this side by 14.28636. Do the same over here. This goes away. And I have um, TF minus 117.82 degrees Celsius equals, I don't even need to give the parentheses anymore because I got rid of everything else. Um, on this side, we have negative 502.08 divided by 14.28636. So negative 35.144. Units are gone over here because this would cancel with this. Um, we're going to have to distribute on this side. We can't get away with not distributing at all. So T final minus 18.44 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to distribute this negative 35.144 to both of those things. Let me rewrite what I got. So T final minus 117.82 degrees Celsius equals negative 35.144 T final minus, we got a negative and a negative, so that's going to turn into a positive. So I need to multiply the 35.144 times 18.44. degrees Celsius. One thing that I know has been a point of confusion in the past, if you just have a variable hanging out by itself, Remember, it does have a one in front of it. So now when I work to combine like terms, there's a one here. So I can add 35.144 TF to this side. And I'm going to add 35.144 TF to that side. This goes away. So I, I could do that one in my head. Um, 36.144 TF minus 117.82 degrees Celsius equals 648.055536 degrees Celsius. I'm going to add Again, working on combining like terms, I'm going to add 117 to both sides. So this part is going away. Back up here, I'm going to continue it over here. This is such a long problem. Typical thermodynamics. 
So we got 36.144 TF. And then I need to take my 648.0536 and add the 117 to that. So equals 765.8736 degrees Celsius. Almost there. We're trying to isolate TF, right? So we're going to divide each side by 36.144. So TF equals 21, I'm getting like 0.189, but I'll just round up, 21.2 degrees Celsius. Does this value make sense? Really quickly here. We have a 117.82 with the stainless steel with the metal, and the water was at 18.44. So the fact that it's in between is definitely a good sign. You know, sometimes um, students are concerned, well, why did it only go up such a little bit? Two things. One is you have a lot more water than metal. So if you put a little bit of metal in a big cup of water, it's not going to have that much of an impact, even if the metal is really hot. The second thing is the specific heat. It takes, the number for water is pretty big. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. Over here though, this is only like 0 0.474.5. So um, it takes a lot less energy to change the temperature of um, the metal. So the hot metal can't really do that much to the water because of the differences in the mass and the differences in the specific heat. It warmed up a little bit, but not anywhere near the temperature of the metal.